What's up, guys? John and Travis here with another intro to a fantastic episode of Elbows Tight Podcast. John, how was that? I know it's an old record, but I really enjoyed that one. <laughs> I think uh, Steve was great, man. He's very eloquent with his speech, and uh, he answered everything so good. I was like, did he research this before? He, you know what I mean? There was like, It was like Biden with his notebook when a reporter would ask him a question. He had great answers. All right, we just went there. What? <laughs> no, we. T so today's guest is Steve Kwan from the BJJ Mental Models podcast, and it is a great episode. The last episode we had Matt Gillette, heavy competitor, big believer in competing, and Steve is the complete opposite. And I really wanted this contrast of someone that dedicates their life to BJJ and competing and then someone that is a casual right like uh, a hobbyist more like more yeah, like us uh, hobbyist right like we like this episode is the guide to the hobbyist life in jujitsu you know what i mean like the hobbyist guide to bjj like that's probably that's probably going to be the name of the episode yeah um, I, but it was good john what was some of the stuff we covered man i loved his talk on uh self-defense and training for self-defense you know and you know you got to make it as realistic as possible i, I thought that was a great point yeah, he he has so many nuggets from this episode. Honestly, every answer is great detail, very knowledgeable. And once I, I say this every once in a while, but I'm like sitting there thinking, like, man, there he's dropping so much in this. I'm gonna have to go back and re-listen to this episode because I feel like I'm I was thinking so hard on some of the things he was saying. I was missing. Yeah, you were taking notes instead yeah. of just learning. That's in the episode. Yeah. Also, I was not expecting his answer when I asked what should someone look for for a gym. I thought it was going to be the generic, you know, schedule. How close is it yeah. to your house? I don't want to give away his answers. You yeah, don't take it. don't take my my joke in the middle of his answer as I think it's funny. It's just like it threw me off. Like his answer threw me off. It was yeah. it's it was a, really a good, good answer, yeah. and I mean I do that all the time for everything, but I was not expecting was that not for expecting his answer. it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, if you guys want to follow Steve BJJ Mental Models podcast everywhere, it's just BJJ Mental Models, not podcast at the end. But all the stuff is going to be down in the description below. If you want to follow him, everything's going to be down below. Uh, it is a great episode. Hopefully, you guys enjoy it. I I know I I enjoyed it quite a bit. And also, don't forget elbowstight dot com. Uh, youtube.com slash elbows tight our podcast on youtube right now and all of our extra content on youtube is blowing up right now so thank you guys so much if you're directly supporting that and if you haven't checked it out yet youtube.com slash elbows tight elbows tight podcast elbows tight everywhere if you look it up we'll be there so thank you guys so much for listening hopefully you enjoy and we'll catch you next time peace send us a patch Send us a patch. Want a patch. We want to send patch. a patch. Somebody be the first person to send us a patch. Someone is the first person. Yeah, you could be the first. Yes. This For the could first be time you. in your life, you could be the first. <laughs> Send us that patch. So after that, you guys have a good night. P.O. Box down below. We'll catch you later. Peace. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Elbows Tight Podcast. It's your host, Travis and John. John, how you doing today? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? I am doing fantastic. Got a delicious beer, got a great guest, and a fresh haircut, so I can't complain at all. You always feel so good after a fresh haircut. I know. It was like, it's like when back in the military, it was like you would get like the hair barely touching your ears, and you're like, uh-oh, it's, time, it's time, to, time to cut it all mm -hmm. off. And, you know, it's like what Charles was talking about today. He's like, you know what I want to do when someone gets a fresh haircut? I want to slap them as hard as possible on the back of the neck. I was like, that's hazing, bro. <laughs> yeah. You gotta wait till you're an adult to do that. <laughs> so, but today's guest is a very special one. I am super excited about this. A very busy man. It took a couple weeks to get him on, but man, I, I am so excited about this. We have Stephen Kwan from the BJJ Mental Models uh, podcast. How are you doing today, Steve? I'm doing great. I also have a fresh haircut, so I feel like one of the crew. There you go. I like it. I like it. Is that a uh, home you did at your house? Or... Oh, yeah. I'm not paying anyone to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you know what? The, I would love to actually clock out the amount of money I've saved doing this to myself for the last, like, I, I think I started doing this, I'd say 15 years ago. And it's it's so liberating because you never have to worry about, oh, is that, how does this haircut look? Is it too short? Is it not short enough? Oh, it, it grew for a few days and now it looks wrong again. I mean, you can't screw up just a complete shave right like if you mess it up you just keep going again and again and again <laughs> and it, there's no such thing as too short so man the amount of money i save on product the amount of time it's just i don't know i just i'll never go back to hair man <laughs> don't need it and plus from a jujitsu context you know if you got to really like drive your shoulder into the dude's face 
you get some of this Ooh. going on, like some of the hair scruff, and it's like sandpaper in their face, right? So nothing's going to give day. you the pressure tap, like if you take half the skin off their head. <laughs> black belt technique of the yeah. day right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about beards, too, you know? They uh, got that fresh stubble, and they're grinding it in. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. But yep. Back when we first started, I was in a lot better shape than I am now. Imagine that. And Funny. Uh, I, I used to go shirtless underneath my gi, or in no gi, I would go shirtless, you know, thinking I was like Gordon Ryan or uh, something. Oh, you're one of those, huh? <laughs> yeah, I he, was, I was. Like to bail out? Get out of this interview. I don't deal with the shirtless weirdos. <laughs> oh, look, it was so weird, too, because what he would do, and he specifically would do it to me. He'd get top, and then he would try to slide his nipple in my mouth. <laughs> You know, and I was, and it's a great way to distract you because you're oh, like, no, is. no. Yeah. yeah. Like That's half so of jujitsu is just psychological warfare with your other <laughs> opponents, honestly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What, what's great is like when you get someone in like a rear naked choke and you start whispering in their ear, like, this is for so and so. And they're like, I don't even know who that is. Like, what's going on? Oh, you have to. I, I was always taught that's just part of the technique. Like, you get in close and you go, like, go to sleep now. It's nighttime. I'm tucking yep. you in. You go night, night. <laughs> I try to talk smack too. I'm like, you're not going to choke me out. Yeah. So John, John, when John first started, he got put in a rear naked choke and in your mind, what was it? Oh, I didn't know. I was like brand new. So yep. I was like, I'll just hold my breath. Like, I, you know, I can hold my breath for a while. And then I was like, wait, I'm passing out here. What's going on? I, I'm not, I still can hold my breath. They're like, bro, it's blood, not, not breathing. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Nobody told me that. <laughs> So, hey, but Steve, let's go ahead and, and uh, get into the, the first question. Can you tell us uh, and the people at home who you are and a little bit of your background, how you got into jiu-jitsu and whatnot? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm Steve Kwan from Vancouver, BC, Canada. I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. I've been training, um, I guess, since around 2008. So as of this recording, that's going to be about 13 years, I think. Um, I've always been a hobbyist, which is probably the thing that I'm most known for is the fact that I just don't compete at all. I've never competed. Um, it just is something that never quite occurred to me, it, which is funny because my brother is also a jujitsu black belt under a different instructor and he competes like crazy. He's a professional jujitsu uh, grappler actually. And so what I'm best known for is probably the BJJ Mental Models podcast and broader education platform. Uh, that all started about three years ago when my brother and I were just talking jujitsu as we do. And we realize that despite the fact that we come from different backgrounds, different instructors, and we have different goals, we still had this shared interest in um, conceptual thinking for jujitsu, kind of learning, not by rote memorization, but learning by understanding patterns and ideas and trying to learn faster. For him, this is important because he's a pro competitor. And as a pro, you want to win. You want to know the most. You want to be the best. And so any learning advantage you can have is going to help you. But for me as a hobbyist, my series of concerns is quite different. I mean, my goal is I, I can maybe train, you know, on a good week, three times a week. So I just don't have that much time. And I'm in there with people who are training six hours a day. So my interest is in the in the little time that I can devote to this thing. I want to get as much out of it as possible. I want to learn the most. I want to be the best I can with that limited schedule. So that's how I kind of got into trying to look for concepts and big ideas that can help me accelerate my learning. So we decided at some point to just put a mic in front of us and record the podcast. And three years later, I'm, I mean, we're still doing that. <laughs> so not much has changed. I mean, I, I guess it's been kind of weird because most of the last few years, I mean, with the pandemic, I've been doing most of my jujitsu stuff remotely, which obviously is um, the, the learning is just not the same, uh, but it has given me the ability to focus on growing the podcast and on getting better guests, sharing bigger ideas. Uh, so that's probably what I'm best known for. What uh got you and your brother in the BJJ? Like what Good made question. you look for um, it? What got my brother into jujitsu was me because I tried it <laughs> and I said, dude, this is the greatest thing ever. You have to try it. And he tried it and he said, dude, you're right. It's great. And we both just started roughly at the same time. I think I started maybe a month or two before him. Um, but just due to living circumstances, um, because I, I worked quite far away from where he, he worked, we just wound up going to different gyms, finding different instructors. And so we kind of came up on two different paths. Um, in terms of why I started jujitsu, I'd always wanted to do martial arts, and, but I just was kind of intimidated by the whole idea, as I think a lot of people are. But when I was around in my, my mid-20s, I kind of just got it into my head that, you know, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to bite the bullet and do it. So I did a bunch of research into the different martial arts. And of course, like everyone else, I learned about this little scrawny Brazilian dude who locked himself in a cage in his pajamas and beat up a bunch of sumo wrestlers <laughs> and kickboxers. 
And I, of course, like everyone else, thought that was a pretty incredible story. Uh, and the more I learned about jujitsu, the more I, I liked the idea of it philosophically, this idea of an art where you can use leverage to defeat the bigger, stronger aggressor, the idea of an art that is uh, an intellectual art, uh, and the idea of an art, perhaps most importantly, where you can win without violence. Um, and I think that's an underrated aspect of jujitsu. I mean, if you are a pro boxer and you need to defend yourself, good luck to the other guy, right? Uh, but if you're a jujitsu person, the whole point of jujitsu is I'm, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to protect me. And if you're good at jujitsu, you can do that. In fact, the better you are at jujitsu, the less likely you are to hurt your opponent. So that to me was the seductive thing about it. Um, I got into training it. Like with everyone else, it very rapidly consumed my entire life. Um, and that's kind of the, the story, right? I mean, it just it's my, my number one go-to hobby. Do you and your brother ever get the chance to roll often? Since you go well, to I mean, schools? not much recently because just with, with the, the the pandemic, I've been mostly completely off the mats. I do jujitsu as a hobby, so I was able to kind of bite the bullet and say, I'm just going to take the time off. I'm going to wait until things settle down a bit, and I'm going to focus on growing the podcast. My brother's a pro gym owner, so he's still doing oh, his thing, although nice. thankfully he's been healthy this whole time through. Um, but probably pretty soon, I'm hoping that we can get back to a more regular training training routine together. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, he doesn't live that far away from me. So it's pretty common for me to drop in at his gym and pretty common for him to drop in at mine. I'm just imagining a real competitive streak. If no, I had a brother, there's, there's no competitive streak. No? Maybe, oh, okay. maybe there was at one point, but it became <laughs> really clear after like a month that I would never win that competition. That's what I was going to be my next question. I was like, do you catch him sometimes though? I mean, you got to catch him sometimes. It, I, nice I mean, wrist yeah, sometimes, but like, look, you, you know how they, you know, that saying about how like, well, if you get two fighters and they fight a hundred yeah. times, the, this one guy's going to win 90 times it's like, uh, with my brother. I don't know. I think he would win like 100 out of 100 times. It's not, <laughs> that, it's not that I've yeah. never caught him. It's just that I would I would probably be more likely to win the lottery than to catch him. He's he's real good. Like he's the top ranked uh, grappler in the province at the moment. So um, a, a mere hobbyist like me who's older than him, smaller than him and out of shape is probably not going to be able to do much damage to him. So I hope he never listens to this because I don't want him to get an ego boost. But. <laughs> That's what I ask. Wait, so is is he the little brother or the big yeah, brother? Right? That's you, what it's I was okay saying. if the big brother beats you up, but when the little brother does, you're like, damn it, man. Like, <laughs> well, I'll I was say still this. first. Um, he's, he's the, in terms of age, he's the little brother. In terms of size, we've always been kind of roughly the same. Although, I mean, he's in much better shape than me because he's a professional athlete. But I will say this, during the pandemic, without jujitsu, my only options are to, for exercise have really been like conditioning and weightlifting. And I've gotten a lot bigger than I, I used to be. So I am looking forward to getting back in there and just squishing him. <laughs> I don't even want to win. Like he can, he can heel hook me or do whatever he wants, but I just want to, you know, just squish him for like at least, yeah. at least 30 seconds is my goal. If I do that, I, I will call that a win. Man, pressure is so intoxicating when you get good at it because you know the person like is so uncomfortable because we've all been there before. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like, so when you, you really like that Khabib Nagamedov like pressure where you're just like sucking someone's soul from their body them. is like it's it's I want to get there one day. And uh, I think because I'm so fat right now, I'm kind of there right now, but <laughs> so but not because of, of technique. Pressure, the beauty of pressure, <laughs> funny timing, because literally the latest episode on our feed as of this recording is with uh, Shanjay Hibero, and he talks about the concepts behind pressure. And the funny thing about pressure is it's not about weight. I mean, weight, nope. weight helps. Weight will accelerate your it's like a, it's like a, a, a form of leverage the more weight you have the easier it will be for you to create pressure but it's not about just laying on top of people it's about strategic pinpoint positioning you want to be really heavy and sharp in some places and really soft and loose in others and if you do it right i mean you can train with tiny people who could just pressure the bejesus out of you like you wouldn't believe. So at, I would say at a white or blue belt level where that refinement isn't there, it sure feels like weight is really going to be mostly what you're talking about when you're talking about pressure. But at a black belt level, pressure is more about strategic positioning, um, surface area, and, and it's also about psychology, right? It's, it's not just about being heavy. It's about trying to break someone's mind and demoralize them because they feel like it's hopeless. So um, yeah, Pressure is probably one of the funnest things about jujitsu when you're the person doing it, I would say. Yeah, definitely, especially when you when you 
you get that, you know, you're like passing into mount or, you know, you have like that perfect like shoulder pressure or like you're just like sucking them nice and close. And then you do you're like transitioning very slowly because, you know, you can because they can't go anywhere. Yeah. Like I hate when it happens to me. Don't get me wrong. But then I'm like, I want to do that to someone like the, yeah. the whole thing with jujitsu. Right. It happens to you. and You're like, I want to do that to someone. I uh, remember when I quit tapping the pressure when we, f- we first started the first probably somewhere in that first month up to six months, I would still tap to pressure. And then I was like, why am I doing this? Nobody else is tapping to it. So I'm like, I'm done. I'm never tapping to that again. Until uh, last year when I was in San Diego, I was rolling with a black belt. And he had to be a good 290, 295. Mm. And when he put that pressure on me, I immediately tapped. There wasn't even a question of me thinking about like, oh, I'm not. Nope. It was immediate. And I tapped right away to it. I was like, good God. Like that man laid it down. Pressure taps are legit. And there's also a self-preservation aspect, right? I mean, if... I work a desk job, right? If, yeah, I'm, I want to have a good competitive role, but I also don't want to go into work looking like an asshole where I've got like someone's handprint on my head or like their gi is <laughs> Like you belong in my... Fight Club? Yeah, exactly. I'm just glad it was a handprint. <laughs> so, so there's like a time, there's a point in time where it's like, okay, I, I guess technically I could get out of this if I want to, but I would rather not leave my skin behind. So I'm just going to give you this one because this is a stupid gym. Um, but yeah, I, it, that is one of the things to pressure to against a white belt. Pressure is like just as devastating a submission as anything else yeah absolutely so you mentioned earlier that you had that little bit of in- intimidation when you were thinking about joining jujitsu mm-hmm. what was the final deciding factor to make the leap and then joining a gym because i know a lot of new practitioners are in that kind of boat like they're on the like i don't i'm kind of nervous because it looks like i don't i'm not going to know anything and people are just going to beat me up and then making that transition to i'm just going to do it what was that deciding factor for you for me honestly what it came down to was that i was young and stupid and stubborn um i i had made the decision prior to going into jujitsu like i did some research and i i decided like i was a you know 20 something single guy in pretty good shape and i just decided I'm just going to do this. And I had it in my head. And I just, I, before I even went into class, I just decided to myself that, okay, no matter what happens, I'm going to stick this through. Um, and of course, like everyone else, my first few classes were horrible because I just got it massacred. Um, but I, I stuck it through because I was, I was just stubborn more than anything else. Um, I, I think also it helps that I got connected pretty early with a few good people in the class who really took an interest in helping me out along the way, making me feel comfortable. I mean, you know how it is. It's one thing to get murdered 20 times in a row by some purple belt. It's another thing if that purple belt is a friend of yours who shakes your hand afterwards and gives you some pointers. You're much more likely to keep coming back. So for me, it was just I I kind of made the mental commitment before I even stepped on the mat that I'm definitely scared of this. I'm definitely intimidated. But... I've, I'm, I've decided I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to go and I'm going to go to more than one class. I'm going to give this a legitimate try. And of course, like everyone in jujitsu, after about a month of it, it's like a drug that you've just mainlined into your body and you just can't get enough of it. So, Absolutely. Your podcast, you talk about uh, concepts over techniques quite a bit, the whole a, a big idea about your podcast. And I had honestly never heard of concepts over techniques until I started listening to your podcast because like most practitioners, one – we don't know the difference between a concept and technique, right? Because no one's really taught us unless they verbally, in in my eyes, unless they verbally say like, this is more of a concept, like think of this, Mm -hmm. but I have never been taught a concept. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. And, but could you explain a little bit better on what a jujitsu concept is and like give an example of ones for people at home? Sure. So in terms of just a straight up dictionary definition, a, a concept is just an idea. I mean, anything can be a, anything can be a concept. And that's why I personally don't use the word concept too much. I prefer to say mental models because that has a a predefined meaning. A concept is just an idea. I mean, anything can be a concept, but what we're looking for here in the context of jujitsu is we're looking to find patterns or general guidelines that more often than not will apply. And it's important to recognize these patterns because as human beings, our brains are primed for pattern recognition. I mean, human beings aren't great at a lot of things, but one of the things we're very good at is recognizing patterns. Um, And that's kind of the, for better or worse, that's why human beings are so clever. It's also why we fall victim to so many dumb biases because we see patterns when they're not there. Um, But pattern recognition is what it's all about. And the idea is if you can identify a pattern 
and you realize that there's just a few things that are kind of almost always the case in jujitsu, you can focus on recognizing and identifying and responding to those few things as opposed to trying to memorize every little micro detail that gets put in front of you. Um, to this day, I would say that most gyms, when you go to the gym, the instructor is going to present you with probably three techniques every class, and the method of instruction is probably going to be they systematically step-by-step -step list off every single step, like left hand goes here, right hand on the collar, pull this way, 45 degree angle shift to the side, foot goes here, foot goes here. Um, even for a black belt, it's often overwhelming to remember that stuff. If you're a white belt, you have no no chance of remembering those details. I remember counting it. I'd be like, he's on yeah, step yeah, 26, yeah. I, I'm lost. I remember being like, I, I, I remember that I've forgotten a step, but that's the only thing I remember. I don't remember what the step was. Um, and I used to really beat myself up over this because I would train quite a lot and for a long time, and I still felt like I didn't know anything. Um, and eventually I realized, actually, apparently that's quite normal. It's really just a flaw with that method of teaching. So now I prefer to look for patterns and concepts and teach those. So if I were trying to teach you, for example, how to do stand up or just generally, you know, like pass the guard any some common situation, I would try to avoid telling you exactly in minute detail where your hand goes and where your leg goes. And I'd give you ideas, like an example of a very common one that is um, keep your limbs coiled in. Don't, unless you have a really good reason, your default should be keep your elbows kind of pinched in, Keep your knees hidden so your opponent cannot get access to them. And of course, don't let them grab your head, right? These are very, very simple ideas. But in the midst of trying to do performative techniques where we're trying to remember what professor told us and we're trying to regurgitate it on the fly, we're so focused on this call and response thing in our mind that we forget to focus on just very simple ideas like keep your elbows pinched in. Keep your knees hidden from your opponent unless you got a really good reason to extend them. Um, I would I would say when I provide video feedback for people, a lot of the time, one of the most common mistakes I see is people are trying to do a technique, but their arms are just out a little bit too far. And that opens up elbow exposure. And now you, the opponent can control your arm and pull you back in. And just the practice of tightening up and making it harder for your opponent to get that access is almost immediately going to make your jujitsu better overnight. Um, the example I give, the parallel would be if you walk into any boxing gym in the world, the first thing they're going to teach you is chin down, hands up, focus on your foot movement, right? That's going to be the first thing. And that's always going to be the same. And 90% of the time when your coach is telling you to do something, they're going to be reminding you to put your hands up because you've forgotten, you dropped them, right? In jujitsu, we don't teach that way. We don't teach people what the default stance should be. We just teach techniques. Um, but what we should really be doing is teaching people, okay, above all else, before you try to do that crazy inverted triangle, Focus on keeping yourself safe, keeping your, your limbs and your head in a position where it's not going to come back to bite you. Focus on that first, and then you can start to do the performative techniques afterwards. But come at it from a, a base of concepts where you can keep yourself in a good state and keep yourself safe. That's basically what I advocate for. I like it. That kind of reminds me of when you're in school and you're trying to take notes. I would find myself taking notes and focusing so much on what they were saying and writing it down that I'd missed the whole point of the class. Like, yes. Then I learned that I learned more if I stopped doing that and I just listened to the teacher. <laughs> I had the same realization. I kind of stopped taking notes because I used to be really um, obsessive about taking notes for everything and studying techniques for using notes and flashcards to recall. Yep. And those work. I mean, they do work, but there comes a point where there's diminishing returns, I think. I mean, if you've been doing that and you have now have a stack of like flashcards that are this high and it gets to the point where it's taking you three hours a day just to review all of that stuff you've kind of lost the forest for the trees and i think you need to reassess how you're spending your time uh same thing with the example you provided is you can get to the point where you're so focused on the note taking that the note taking becomes the objective whereas the yeah. real objective should be learn the damn lesson but it's hard to do that when you're so fully intent on making sure that you record every idea you're no longer a student you're a transcriber at that point, and that's not beneficial to you in the long term. Totally agree. That was a great realization. Like when it dawned on me, I was like, oh, now this is so much easier. I, I kind of play that into jujitsu too, because at some points I'm like, okay, I really want to learn this technique. So I'm going to mimic what they're doing 
instead of listening to what they're doing, right? So I'll like act like, you know, they're like, okay, so you're going to place your hands here and pass the guard. And I'm acting it out in middle of class as they're doing it. And then I go back and I'm like, shit, I don't even remember what I'm yeah. supposed to do, man. Like, <laughs> we look at each other. Do you, do you remember what he was just doing? Like, I was acting it out. I feel but like, no, I don't remember it at all. So. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is just a a natural inclination for coaches to try to throw as much info at their students as possible. Because in the coach's mind, the coach is thinking, there are so many details to this technique, and you're just not going to pull this off at a, at a high level unless you know all of these details and you master them. So I want to give you all of that information. I want to make sure you got it all. And so they just hit you with everything all at once. And that comes from a good place. But the reality is, if this is something new and novel to you, and you haven't seen that technique before, the cognitive load of trying to memorize all of those details at once is just too much. And so I think a lot of the times you're better off as the coach, just trying to focus on really giving people one thing. I mean, if I can go through a, a one hour class and my students can take one single detail that they can apply for the rest of their journey, I'd call that a win, right? Because if you can do that every single day for the rest of your life, you're going to be pretty good at jujitsu pretty quickly. I think the challenge is that in a lot of cases with classes, they overwhelm you with details and you retain none of it. And so yes. what you get out of the class is a bit of muscle memory drilling and some team building and you burn some calories and all of those are good things. But if you go into the class and you go through it and at the end of the class, you haven't changed your game or your mindset or your thinking in any way, really you didn't get that much out of jujitsu in that day, right? You would be better if you had just got one thing out of it, just one little detail that you could immediately apply. And so I think the best way for coaches to deal with that is reduce the amount of things you're trying to throw at students all at once. I mean, there's always going to be more classes, right? If there's 20 critical details in the next class, you can teach them the next detail, right? You got a lot of time. You don't have to get it all into their head in a one hour session. So I think that that's an important consideration for coaches. Yeah, because I've met or I've been in classes before, not only at our school, but uh, the the whoever the instructor is, it's like, oh man, I didn't get through everything that I wanted to. We ran out of time, and it's like, well, that's okay. Like, I would rather have you get as much detail into the things that you can capture within that one hour period than you trying to force feed four different techniques that. I'm not going to really retain any of them. No offense. You know what I right. mean? Like, I don't need a Baron Bolo to back take to rear naked choke failure into arm bar or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. like, like, show me one of our, our instructor now, our professor now, when he first came in, he kind of really did a systematic uh, approach to techniques. It was uh, Tuesday. We're doing the first half of this technique. Right. And I'll show you a little bit here and there, maybe a submission, but really we're just focusing on the first half of this movement. Then Thursday is going to be the second half of the this movement. That way we get like a whole day of like maybe Learning two it. different ways to get into that position or that submission or whatever it is. And then the next day is going to be, okay, now we're finishing it and what happens if it doesn't, if you fail kind of mindset. And that was a big game changer for us also because it, it was more of – like, okay, I know exactly what we're doing today. I know exactly what we're doing tomorrow. And on Monday next week, we are just going a little bit further and further. And we would spend like, I don't know, two, three weeks on a single technique, which I thought, which I think is very beneficial because yeah. I'm sure we've all, anyone listening to this podcast that's been to more than one gym, uh, I'm sure we've all been to those gyms where it's like Monday, okay, we're going to do arm bars. Thursday, we're going to do uh, back takes. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, and it's just like yeah. bouncing all over the place. And you're like, well, I don't remember what we did earlier. In the week. You know, that way it helped with attendance as well, because nobody wanted to miss that first Monday. Because if you did, then you were lost you're screwed. in the next three weeks. Yep. It's like watching yeah. 24. You miss one episode and you have no idea what's going on anymore. <laughs> You're like, I'm done. I'm out. I, yeah. I was like, man, he has way more happen in one hour than I do. Let me tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> this guy got more done during the commercial break than I get done in a whole year for crying out loud. Um, yeah, what you're describing is, is a, I think, a common problem, which is that I think coaches don't realize that we would be better off if we spent more time focusing on one single thing. I mean, I remember I went to a, a seminar with Rob Bernacki, and he spent like two and a half to three hours showing one thing one mm. technique. And I, I've never seen that before. You know, normally when I go to a seminar, it's like almost a race to see how many techniques you can cram into this block. I've been to seminars where there were like a dozen techniques in the, the two yes. hour block. No one's going to retain any of that. And so 
it kind of blew my mind that you would do a seminar with one thing that you wanted to show. You would charge people money and you would show them one thing and you would make them do it for two and a half hours. I thought I was going to be bored out of my mind. I thought it was a, this is just not going to work. It was maybe one of the best seminars I've ever been to because mm. you retain it, right? Because you actually have time to drill it. If I, if your coach gives you a technique and they give you three minutes to drill it and you have to split that drilling time with your training partner you're not going to remember anything. I mean, if you want to learn something, you got to drill it for hours and hours and hours. And the best use of your time from a coach's standpoint is giving people that repetition time. If you're trying to play a speed game where it's like speed dating, it's like surprise, arm bar, okay, next one, surprise, triangle. Um, <laughs> none of that will be retained, right? It's just not going to stick with anybody. So Steve, I had a question. Do you yep. have any um, regrets on not competing? Uh, this is an interesting question because, you know, it, it's hard sometimes to really know what your own motivations are, right? I I am happy that I don't compete. I have no interest in doing it now. And if you ask me, I'll tell you, I just, I don't, for me, it's just not for me. But at the same time, I can't honestly tell you that that's how I really feel. I have to acknowledge there's the possibility that I'm just thinking defensively and I don't want to admit that I failed to do something that I should have done, right? Because there was a time when I was a white belt that I was thinking about it and I was excited about it and I just decided not to and I just never got back into that mindset. And I can never truly say that I made, I know for certain that I made that decision because I wanted to. There's always a part of me that will always wonder, did I, am I just justifying the fact that I was scared? Um, and I, I'll never know the answer to that, right? It, but it's one way or the other, it's just something that I didn't decide to do. And the older I get and the more I train, the less interested I am, honestly. I mean, once you, once you hit 40 and you have kids and you're, you know, things aren't, you're not as fast as you used to be and you're more worried about your own health because when you're 20, you really aren't thinking that long term about your injuries, right? At this point, I'm just happy if I can get through the class without an injury and, and, and have a good time and burn some calories and see my friends. So at this point in time, I have no regrets. Um, but there is always going to be that part of me that wonders how much of my non-competition decision uh, is comes from me having been afraid at some point. I'll never know the answer to that. One one of the people that we just recently interviewed, he talked about how he probably wouldn't ever promote someone to black belt unless they've competed at least once. And it, it kind of I was like, man, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that, but I can kind of see where he's coming from. Because we've heard many people say, you know, the best instructors are going to be those that compete. The best black belts are going to be those that compete. And I kind of push back on that because just because you're a world class athlete doesn't mean you're a world class teacher. Right. Yeah. How many how many people have we met that uh, are Olympic coaches, right? They're, they have Olympians underneath them that were never at the Olympics, mm -hmm. right? They were never that level, but they can, they can deliver a message. They can get people to move the way that they're supposed to, and they never, they never did it. And you don't, in my eyes, you don't have to compete in order to produce a, a world-class athlete. You know, how do you, how do you feel about that when people say like oh man like you're not a, I'm, I'm not saying that they say that you're not a real black belt but people out there like oh you're not a real black belt unless you've you've competed before like what, well what goes technically your mind? I'm not a real black belt because I refuse to pay the IBJJF any money so technically you're right. <laughs> um, I, my instructor gave me a piece of paper but I'm definitely not registered in the IBJJF master database um I, I mean my my brief answer of course is I don't really care at all what other people think. But the longer answer to get to what I think you're trying to get to here is um, I agree with you that there's really no requirement for someone to be a competitor um, if they want to be a coach. They're two completely different skill sets. I, I have not seen any evidence that being a successful competitor translates to being a good coach. Some people happen to be good at both things. A lot of the best coaches are not competitors, or maybe they did it once or twice and they just lost interest or never did it. If you look at any other sport, more, you know, legitimate sports, bigger sports, sports that my mom and dad would have heard of, it's not common to have coaches who just don't train or they don't do the sport professionally. It's a different skill set. Um, and I think we've got enough examples of really, really famous competitor athletes who are notoriously really bad teachers to know that that's, you know, being a good competitor does not guarantee you're going to be a good teacher at all. In fact, you could argue that it could be detrimental because the mindset of a competitor trying to win for themselves is very different from the mindset of a coach that is sacrificing for their team. You know, thinking about it, when you asked him that question like that, I mean, I guess if you looked historically, was jujitsu like even meant for a sport platform like that? So I wouldn't think you'd need to be 
a competitor to be a good black belt instructor. No, I listened to the Hicks and Gracie book and you breathe the life and flow. And he talks about that. It kind of branched off from jujitsu being Brazilian jujitsu being self-defense. And mm-hmm. then, uh, Carlos Gracie going to wanting to come. I think it was Carlos Gracie. Uh, someone DM me on Instagram, call me stupid if it's not, but, um, <laughs> he, he's the one that kind of turned it into IBJF and the, the whole competitive side. But originally, you know, jujitsu was for self-defense and valetudos and, and stuff like that mm-hmm. down in, down in Brazil. So, yeah, but, and I think it's also reasonable to assume that the OG Gracies probably never could have foreseen what would have come of the sport, right? I mean, they created their own flavor of judo for the purpose of self-defense, and they marketed it so that it would spread, and ultimately, of course, so they could feed their families and profit off of it. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but they could not have foreseen that it would have blown up to this level. They could not have foreseen – I mean, I'm, I'm sure that – Elio Gracie never imagined that this would one day turn into the UFC and create it, you know, a whole new sport. None of that could have been foreseen. So I, I think it's probably pretty safe to say that back then, I, I would presume the OG Gracies probably weren't really thinking too much about like the coach student relationship. They were just kind of figuring it out as they went. Um, and a lot of that culture still persists today. It's a very, um, it's kind of a very experimental art. It's still very immature in terms of the process. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why you don't see a lot of like sports psychology in jujitsu um, or a lot of cognitive learning practices applied in jujitsu. It's just a lot of people just going in and hustling as much as they can. Whereas if you look at a lot of other sports, when you compete at a high level, you have dedicated coaching crews. Um, there's There are whole wings of psychology devoted to sport performance, right? And you see a much deeper investment in that, I think, than you're likely to see in most jujitsu classes. Why do you think they push? Com- well, I don't, why do you think schools push competition so much? Well, jujitsu is an empirical sport, right? Um, jiu-jitsu's intrinsic value is that you can use it to protect yourself and a lot of other martial arts promise that but the difference behind jiu-jitsu is the whole reason jiu-jitsu became famous is because that was proven in the most public way possible right that history is always going to be a part of why people train this sport and we can't just go and street fight each other all day like they used to (laughs) to figure out who's the best and what works and what doesn't so the compromise we have is this competitive structure and that's basically where we go out and we take our ideas and our strategies and our athletes and we put them against each other and the best person wins right that's the idea um and so that's so ingrained in why we do this jujitsu is popular because it's empirically proven to work and so i think competition will always be a part of it because that's part of why we do this and don't get me wrong i am not knocking competition it's just not for me but i am so glad that it happens because if it didn't the evolution of the sport would be stifled i mean we'd probably still be training like we did back in 1990 if not for the fact that it's a very competitive sport so i love the fact that there's a competition scene i love the fact that there's people who are willing to go out there and beat each other up for like a five dollar plastic medal in a high school gym (laughs) i'm just saying that's not for me but i'm glad that other people want to do that because i benefit from them doing that yeah that's i like that answer well you know one thing i do like about um i've only competed once the only thing i really liked about it was it feels like you get a fair shake because it's someone your age your weight you know that's kind of nice because a lot of times in the gym i don't know how your gym is but you know most of the people will be from in my case they're big they're big that you know i'm outweighed they're normally younger so that was the only thing i liked about the competition was it felt like a totally even playing field but I also hated the build up to it. I hated the nerves, you know, and, and I think I, I, I must have pulled a muscle for a good six months after that competition. <laughs> so now I'm like, I, I don't know if I'll do it again. Well, the so argument we'll to be made for competition is that it does teach mental resilience because it puts you in an incredibly stressful situation and you have to learn to deal with that. That said, though, I think the mistake that a lot of jiu-jitsu people make when they swear up and down about the importance of competition is they're assuming that jiu-jitsu is the only way in life to do that, which is not true. There's a lot of things you can do that will put yourselves into stressful situations, and you have to learn to deal with that. I mean, anyone in a high-performance field understands what a job can be like, and a a hard job can be just as stressful in that regard as jiu-jitsu. So jiu-jitsu is not the only way to toughen your, your mindset, but it is a way to do it. So I understand understand why people enjoy competing it's just for me i it just it doesn't appeal to me especially now as i'm older i got kids right I, there's too much to lose and not enough to gain it's so funny you mentioned the 
the you have a career to worry about because one of the <laughs> most real things that our professor has like ever told us was in the middle of class he looked at us i think it was like the end of the class he just looked at everyone he's like look no one's gonna be a world champ here let's be honest he's like we all have 401ks to worry about he's like and that's okay you don't have to <laughs> join jujitsu and and compete and be a world champ he's like do i think you should compete absolutely but it's not for everyone you know and like you mentioned you you got nipped by the bug, right? It was like mainline and straight jujitsu when you <laughs> yeah. first started, right? I love that analogy. It's so funny. Um, I feel like, especially at the beginning of people's journeys, they kind of can have maybe a little bit of an unhealthy obsession with jujitsu. Oh, right? yeah. It's kind of like the CrossFitters where they're like, all they want to talk about is CrossFit. All pe- all white belts want to talk about is jujitsu. You get their blue belt and like, so did I tell you I, I do jujitsu? Like, I'm a blue belt. It's I have no a big blue deal. belt. In any other martial art, that would be just like a black belt, just so you know. I don't have yeah. a black belt, but let's just pretend <laughs> I do because I told you this. I, I've heard this story many times, yes. Yeah, right? So how how you mention that you know you're you are you don't regret not competing right how do you how can people be okay with being a casual and have that healthy relationship with jujitsu and not you know fall to the 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 pressure of competing and just like look man i I just do this for fun i like the camaraderie like how how would you encourage people to be okay with that the there's a few ways to approach this i'd say that the first thing for everyone to consider is time and compartmentalizing your time and being okay with how you invest your time The reality is there's, look, there's a lot of different currencies in the world, but time is one currency that you can't negotiate on. There's no way to get so rich that you can buy more time, at least as far as I know. (laughs) So you got to be very judicious with how you spend your time. And you have to, when you make a decision to spend your time, you should spend it that way unapologetically. And if you make the decision to put three hours of your precious time once a week into jujitsu, that's um, that's a pretty consistent hobbyist schedule, but that's not going to win you a world championship. But you should be okay with that, right? You've set a constraint and you said, look, I am willing to give jujitsu three hours of my life every week. And within that three hour box, I'm going to do what I can. And I'm going to do the best I can. And I'm going to have fun. And the standard I'm going to hold myself to is, am I getting the biggest investment out of those three hours as I possibly could? And if you think of things that way, then I think you're going to be a lot more happy with how you invest your time. Because I think the challenge people have with jujitsu is it is a very personal experience to have your ass handed to you by somebody else. (laughs) Um, And it's very easy to let that conflate in with the rest of your ego and your sense of self-worth. And that's a mistake. Um, I mean, if I am, if I'm training three times a week, an hour a week, and then I go in there and I roll with Craig Jones, is it really reasonable for me to beat myself up after he inevitably heel hooks me, right? Like, am I really, <laughs> should I really feel bad about that? It's like, no, if I am, if I am able to get a lot of value out of these three hours I'm investing a week, I should be happy about that. Um, and I should be willing to accept that. And that, I mean, I, I'm just, the example I'm giving is if you were, if you were, uh, you know, setting up a piece of Ikea furniture and you had no experience as a carpenter or anything and you didn't do a great job, would you beat yourself up over it? No, because you're not a you're not an expert in it, right? It's just a thing that you're doing because you want to do it because you allocated the time to it. Uh, and similarly, I, I don't think it's reasonable for someone who's doing jujitsu just for fun to go in there and hold themselves to the same standard of someone who's making 10x the investment of time. It's just a different thing, right? You might as well treat it like a different sport, a different profession. I mean, I would not feel down on myself if my accountant knew more about accounting than me. In fact, I would expect them to know more about it than me. That's why I pay them. And you should have the same relationship with jujitsu pros, right? You shouldn't beat yourself up because your instructor kicks your ass all the time and feel bad about who you are. No, you would expect them to because they're the expert and that's why you pay them right? This is all working according to plan. So it's just a matter of reframing it. So it's not about, am I getting tapped or not? It's about, am I making a good investment of the time I've decided to commit? Absolutely. And I think people get hung up, especially because when you first start, you you look for technique, you look for more instruction, whether it's through Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, whatever it is, BJJ uh, fanatics, all these things, right? And then you start watching these and you're trying to absorb it. And then you go try to put it in practical use in class and it doesn't work, right? And you're like, man, I'm paying all this. I'm watching all these videos and this and that. It's like, look, man, like it takes more than one YouTube video to get good at jujitsu. There's people that have been doing it for 30 years that are still learning how to be good at jujitsu. And I feel like new practitioners really beat themselves up sometimes. I know I did. There was there was a point where I was a white belt and I was like, man, I feel like I'm going to class right now and I'm not 
retaining anything, but it's it it it's, it all it all levels out. It's, there's you're going to have highs and lows, and especially yeah. if you're if you don't want to be a world champ or you're not training to be a world champ, bro. What does it matter? Yeah. You know, like, and honestly, it's also it important to know that nobody knows everything in any endeavor, but especially in jujitsu. This this is a rapidly developing sport. This is not a martial art that has been consistent and exactly the same for the last 100 years. I mean, when my daughter was born, I took a year and a half off jujitsu to focus on the family. I came back and the whole sport had changed in that time I was gone. Um, but that's part of when the leg lock game exploded. I remember I came back I hadn't trained for like a year and a half. I was like almost a black belt at the time. And there were blue belts that were like tapping me with heel hooks. And I outweighed them by like 60 pounds and they were just tuning me. And it's because this there was this whole wing of knowledge that I hadn't developed yet. And you can either beat yourself up for that or you can throw yourself in the shark tank and enjoy it and try to learn from it. Um, and it's okay to understand that not everyone knows every aspect of jujitsu. One of the cool things about jujitsu is that it's so expansive and there's so many different things that you can do that it really allows you to create a game that expresses your personality and the kind of person you are. I think with most kind of black belts, if you were to talk to them and ask them to really break down and analyze their game, they could probably tell you not just what they're doing, but also why they're doing that from a philosophical standpoint, right? Not just because this technique works or not, but because this is the kind of jujitsu that I want to do. Um, and the fact that there's that much variability is part of what is cool about jujitsu. And being good at jujitsu is not necessarily about knowing every detail. It's about knowing enough about how to play your game that if some person comes to you and they try to do something crazy that you've never seen before, you still have a way to pull them back into your game so you can force them to do the thing that you want to do. So it's just interesting. Uh, we had Margot Ciccarelli up here recently, and her jiu-jitsu looks like nothing I've ever seen before, right? It's a completely bizarre version of jiu-jitsu compared to what I do, which is more traditional and classical. I, and I have no clue what she's doing. Like when I watch Margot Ciccarelli do stuff to me i don't even know what's happening it looks like two aliens having sex like it's just <laughs> there's just like arms and legs and spinning and i got no clue what's going on um but it's a very different expression of jujitsu than what i was brought up doing and that's okay right i don't have to know that stuff although i'm imminently curious about it I'm, there's no way you're going to catch me doing somersaults and rolling over my head like that but at the same time i'm fascinated that that exists and i like to learn that stuff so that if for no other reason, people won't do it to me and I can stop them. Um, when do you think, at what point do people start developing their game? I thought that was interesting yeah. when you said that. Because like, uh, for myself now, I think when I'm in class and maybe we're learning a new move, I immediately know if it's something I'm going to use or not. That's a great yeah. question. Um, I'll still learn the technique, but I, in my head I'm thinking that's not part of my game. Like, I'm <laughs> yeah, glad yeah. I know it. I'm never going to use it. But I'm just wondering, like, I don't know when I had that mindset, like at what point I started thinking of as my game versus. Yeah, it, it's a tough teaching. one because this is on, on one hand, you have to be in tune with yourself. And if your your mind and your body are telling you something, you have to listen. But on the other hand, you're simply not going to get good at anything unless you practice it. So you also don't want to run away from new things because that thing you're not good at now might become your A game 10 years from now. So it is a balance. But I think there's something definitely to be said about. Sometimes you just see a technique and you just know this is my technique. Um, and, and that's yeah. not something that you have to be super advanced to do. I mean, I think most people probably start to find pieces like that at white belt. I remember at white belt seeing certain chokes being done and just just knowing this is going to be the thing I do. And now, granted, maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Maybe if you think that way, it, it makes it more likely that you're going to focus on that. But I think it's safe to say that you you have to listen to your mind and your body and if something doesn't feel right for you for whatever reason, that's okay. There's always other stuff to do. Um, and I'd say that, like I said, as early as white belt, I think you start getting that feeling. And sometimes you just do something and you just realize, I just really like this move. And that becomes kind of a staple of your game. I would 100% agree with that. Definitely, because there's a lot of times when they're showing a technique and even our professor or who's ever doing a seminar or something like that, they're like, this might not work for you and might not be part of your game, right? So you're already in your head, like, doing this technique, and you're thinking, like, man, I can't lock a triangle in like this because I have thunder thighs or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, 
and then you're kind of you're kind of building around i think the biggest thing that plays into someone's game is obviously physical attributes i would say is because if they if they're a bigger person or a smaller person it, they're not going to be doing certain things because it's not advantageous to their body style in my eyes I know lots of people that are super flexible that can do some crazy things. I'm not super flexible, <laughs> so I'm not going to try to do their moves. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's kind of. I like wish I could remember that one move they were teaching in class, and I think three of us got injured like immediately, and they were like, "We're done with that move. Everyone, yep. stop and We're just moving on to something else." I don't. I don't think I was there. I think oh, I might have missed that one. Yeah, thing. it was like, a baby one. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you're like, saying is a, is an unpopular opinion, but in my mind, it's completely true. Uh, we want to believe this romantic idea that. Jiu-jitsu is for everyone and everyone can do a technique if only they're good enough. But the reality is mechanics matter, right? We, you, can't ignore, you can't ignore the rules of physics. If you have different body dimensions, it's just going to make some things easier and some things harder. That's just the way it is. Um, I mean, I, for the longest time, I was a big believer that, you know, I really got to get good at the triangle. I just, it, it, the problem is I'm not particularly tall i have short thick legs a lot of people i can't even lock the stupid thing on and i just had it in my head like, i gotta do it because i'd see all of these really great coaches say well the reason you can't do the triangle is because you just it's not a body dimensions thing it's just that you haven't trained it enough meanwhile this yeah. is like a person who's got like eight foot long legs um cut yeah. the angle cut the angle yeah. Yeah, how much more angle, angle yeah. do i need to yeah. cut the, the reality is Body dimensions matter, and, and this is this is where actually a lot of the concept stuff becomes helpful because once you kind of have an inkling of how the human body works and how these mechanics work, you can really quickly tell if something is a good idea or not based on your attributes and your opponents. Um, something I've talked about a, a lot on the podcast is um, – Jiu-jitsu is really all about controlling levers, right? Whether that be someone's arm or their leg or their head. You're trying to grab and latch onto something and do something to it. That's kind of what we do in jiu-jitsu because uh, that's how you get outsized leverage versus just picking someone up and throwing them like in pro wrestling. So um, the the thing to bear in mind, though, is if I'm trying to attack one of your levers, like I just grab and latch onto your head, it's pretty easy for me to get a lot of power there. I, I might be sacrificing a bit of control, um, but it's pretty easy for me. No matter how big you are versus me, if I grab your neck, you're in trouble. Um, similarly, there's a lot of other submissions that attack two levers at once. Uh, the triangle is a great idea, right? You are it, The triangle choke is technically a head and arm choke. You're choking a, a person by controlling their head and their arm, but unlike a, a regular head and arm choke, you're doing it with your legs. And the thing that I eventually came to realize is, look, if you're a smaller person fighting up weight classes, you never want to do one of those double lever attacks because you're just not going to have the power to finish it, right? I am not going to be able to grab someone really big and triangle them because they're just too much. They're too big. What I need to do against a bigger person is get one thing and get it really good. Like put all of my power behind an arm bar, a choke. But if I'm attacking your head and your arm at the same time, I'm splitting my power. And as a smaller person, I can't afford to do that. Now, on the other hand, roles reverse. If you're a bigger person, the opposite might be true. Because if you're fighting a bunch of tiny scrambly people, what you want to do is control them, right? I want to grab you and put you in a head and arm choke because then you can't move. Um, now that said, the head and arm choke, is it are, are you going to get less of a squeeze than if you did a guillotine or something? Yeah, probably. But if you're big and strong, you might still be able to get enough power to finish someone that way. Whereas if you're really small, for example, against a really big person, it's just, it's unlikely you're going to head and arm choke someone if they outweigh you by 50 pounds or 100 pounds. So that realization that there's these two categories of attacks, right? You can attack one thing at a time or two things at a time. It helps me understand that in, in the moment, what to do and what not to do. So if I'm fighting someone big and I, I'm playing guard and I see an opening, I'm, I'm going to really think about it before I go for a triangle if they're really big. Because I know that attacking two things at once could put me in a bad spot. But if I see an arm bar or an omoplata, I'm going to go for it, right? I'm going to take it because I know I can get that. That's a good question. That was a good answer, too. I agree. Steve, do you play chess? Um, not in a long, long time. I used to play it when I was a kid. Uh, now I'm terrible at it. Like my four-year-old daughter wipes the floor with me. <laughs> I just wanted to know uh, which color you preferred when you play it. Like, I want to start asking everyone that does jiu-jitsu because I think that'll tell me a lot about their game. Um, I usually like this whatever. This is interesting. I, it's been so long since I played chess. I can't even remember. Is it white that goes first? I don't remember. Yeah, white is offensive and, and black is defense. Yeah, I always liked white. 
See, I was just curious because I always prefer black and I'm defensive and I'm thinking, man, that's my problem in jujitsu too because I'm the same way. I'm always thinking defensive. Well, what's weird like is I think behind. defensively in jujitsu. So I, I don't know. Oh, I'm very oh. defensive in terms of the Travis? way I play. Uh, whichever side I'm on the chess board. <laughs> <laughs> don't expect too much from me out of chess. I'm like, the rook goes here. And they're like, that, that, that's not how it works. All right, the pawn goes here. They're like, that's not how I'm like. All right, checkmate. I was just curious because I feel like you're always a little bit behind in the scramble when you think that way. I wish I could think more offensively instead of always worrying about defense. Well, defense so, is the foundation for everything. Um, I It's funny. I've been seeing uh, Preet Mikkelsen go back and forth with a bunch of people about this recently on Reddit in this debate about whether you should be offensive or defensive. God, Reddit. Um, yeah, freaking Reddit. Uh, and the... <laughs> The the takeaway here, like, I really think that the most important thing in jiu-jitsu is to have a solid defensive framework more than anything. I mean, if the goal of this whole thing is self-defense, your focus should be on protecting yourself. I mean, if I get jumped by someone on the street, I don't really care if I triangle them or armbar them. That's not my goal, right? My goal is to survive and stay safe. And as long as I can do that, I'm happy. Uh, so defense should really be the foundation but the reality is, if you are 100% defensive, you will lose by definition. You can't win if you don't attack. So there's this dichotomy of, on one hand, you want to have a strong defensive base. But on the other hand, you also want to take and control the initiative. So you kind of have to do both things at the same time. And um, it's very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you think it's okay for white belts to be spazzy as long as they're safe? I think those two things, I mean, at least the way that I would define it, those two things are opposites. I mean, to me, Agreed. spazzy means not safe. That's basically how I would define it. Uh, spazzy doesn't mean quick or explosive or athletic to me. It means not safe. Um, I spar with a lot of black belts who are big, explosive, fast, and they can throw me around. And I feel totally safe because I know them and they're black belts and I know they're not going to do something dumb. Um, so for me, it's you can't be spazzy and safe at the same time. I see those as opposites, but I see what you're saying, right? You're basically talking about, okay, you're in there with crazy aggro person who is just like, they're, you know, roided up to the gills and they want to, they want to win the gym medal for the day. So they're, they've decided they're going to take your scalp and they're going to, you know, stand on the gym podium and they're going to beat you one way or the other, even though you're a 50 year old accountant and you don't yes, care about yes. you, they're still gonna Like you win, you win. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that it's, it's okay to be athletic. It's okay to be intense and we don't want to breed that out of people we don't want to scare people so much about this that they they're afraid to even try uh, and this happens a lot to big guys is they get coached and conditioned so heavily not to hurt people that they're afraid to move I've, I've seen this happen where i've sparred with really experienced people and i can tell they're terrified of doing anything because they think that if they do anything, they're going to break me and they're going to injure me and I'm going to hate them forever. But it's like, no, I want you to give me realistic resistance, especially if you're a bigger, stronger person, because I'm here to learn to fight, right? I mean, if the, the whole use case for this is some giant dude attacks me in a back alley and I want to be able to protect myself. If you're a big, strong person, you are blessed with having the opportunity to give smaller people realistic training for that use case. Um, and so I think you want big, strong, aggressive, crazy people. Uh, but a lot of it is just about body mechanics and teaching people what's a safe movement and what is not a safe movement. Um, and that just comes down to practice and coaching, right? And most, again, most gyms don't teach this. They won't sit you down and explain to you on day one, here's how to position your body safely. They'll sit you down on day one and say, here's 10 steps to do an arm bar. Now do an arm bar to Bob over there and that's it. So you're not given that context about how to do it safely. Whereas again, bringing it back to boxing, the first and most important thing they will do is teach you how to do it safely. Um, and I think in jujitsu, we, we miss that. So I would say that presuming you're training with someone that has been taught to be safe, I don't care how big and athletic they are. I, I relish the opportunity to spar with bigger people, um, even the intense ones, as long as I'm confident that they're not going to hurt me through their own negligence, right? Well, you mentioned one thing in there that John and I have been talking about lately because recently we had unfortunately we had a woman that was uh assaulted on her way leaving work in in oh. our town terrible terrible Sorry right yeah and our wives came to us asking like oh what move should she have used to to get out of that situation and we're like uh not be in the situation unfortunately you know like it's just one of those things like she did everything she pulled a knife out she kicked, ball, screamed, ball, bit, bit like everything. Like everything to get away from this guy. And not, he was just so big and so strong. He just, he unfortunately, at po 
it, the most terrible part is in the interview. She said, at one point, I just gave in because I knew I was more likely to survive by not fighting than continue to fighting. And it really struck a chord with me because, you know, we, we have these women's self-defense classes, and I absolutely think women should do women's self-defense classes. But at the end of the day, like you mentioned, a larger opponent is going to give you more of a realistic resistance than you, you, you expect, right? Like, I feel like my wife asked me, like, how many, how many, <laughs> should I do a woman's self-defense class? And I was like, yeah, absolutely you should. But I think your biggest bang for your buck and the more you're going to learn is by actually just training, like being consistent mm-hmm. at training. Like that's going to, that's going to help you out the most. And it's, it's, it's a really, I don't know, it's a touchy subject, especially nowadays, because, you know, people, people with the whole sexual assault things in gyms and whatnot. Yeah, I think what you're saying is what what we hear a lot is the women want to only do women's self-defense with other women. And I'm like, I get that, but I feel like you're doing yourself a disservice. What you should do is roll with a guy and feel like what it would be like if you're really going to be attacked so you can defend yourself. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It is a touchy subject. It's it's um it's a tricky one. And my thinking on this has kind of evolved over the years back and forth as I learn more and I hear more stories about what people go through. Um, and I, I don't by any means purport to have the right answer on this. So I'm what yeah. I'm saying, what I'm about to say here is just my thought based on what I've observed, which is far from complete or educated on the matter. Um, I think it is pretty irrefutable to say that, like, you are what you train. We we know this, right? You if you want to be good at something, you have to do it. You have to train it. And if your use case for this, and it's fine if it's not your use case, right? Um, if your use case is that you want to use jujitsu for self-defense, it makes sense to train it against the most realistic type of opponent who would resemble your attacker and to have them act the way an attacker would. Now, not everyone has that that goal, right? A lot of women get into jujitsu because they want to be champions, and in which case their games are going to evolve and look totally different, completely yeah. different if that's your goal. Absolutely. Um, so the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, what is your goal? And then ultimately, you in an ideal world, you want your training to match your goal. So if I can, if I can abstract every every um, emotional and cultural consideration in an ideal world, if your goal is to protect yourself from big aggressive men, then the training environment should be against big aggressive men that you trust. That's, and basically you just get them to give you simulated pressure. Now, then however, we have to temper that with what actually happens in the real world, which is that the vast majority of gyms are not for whatever reason, not always intentional, but they're just not super welcoming to women. And the more that I host on on the podcast and talk to prominent women in the sport, the more I see their perspective, right? I mean, just think about it. Let's say that you wanted to go to a martial art and and you went to, you, you walked in there and everyone that was in there was like 30 years younger than you. And no one wanted to talk to you because you were different from them for whatever reason. And you were the only person like yourself in that class. And you go to get changed and they say, well, we have a change room for everyone else, but we don't have a change room for you. So you got to go into the bathroom or go outside or go to your car to get changed. Uh, you, regardless of what happens on the mats, you have sent people a very subtle signal that this is not your place. And in an ideal world, none of that would matter. In an ideal world, we'd throw the men and the women together and everyone would train well together. But you will never get people to the point where that happens unless you can get them in the door in the first place, right? It, the ideal of everyone training together in this big happy utopia never happens if all of the women are scared off out of the gate because they think you have some weird alpha bro gym, right? So this raises the questions of like, do you have female instructors? Do you have a female change room? Is the the women's experience at your gym going to be comparable to the men's experience? Because the first thing you have to do is get them into the door. And in an ideal world, pressure makes diamonds and iron sharpens iron and lions are always hungry and all that bullshit, right? But the reality (laughs) is there is an on-ramp and not everyone is ready to be a modern day samurai out of the gate. There are probably a lot of people who would have made incredible world champions one day, but they never got the first stripe on their white belt because they had such a negative experience that they just walked away. That's where we stand with, with women's training. So I am all for women's classes if that gets people into the sport, but I would then also make sure that we always have a conversation with people about what are your goals. If your goal is to, and this is not even about 
self-defense necessarily, but it, although it should, it can be, if your goal is to fight up weight classes where you're expecting to be fighting someone a hundred plus pounds bigger than you, then you better be training with people who are a hundred plus pounds bigger than you. If on the other hand, your goal is to go off and win Mundials, then by all means, go in there and fight competitive people your own size. So I am all for um, women's classes if that brings more inclusivity to the sport. But I think it's important that at some point we just explain to people that you are what you train. And if your goal here, if your goal, if the reason you came here is because you want to learn how to defend yourself against a bigger, stronger monster, then our job is to give you simulated monsters that you can fight. And you eventually you'll have to do that if you want to be able to survive in that situation. That's a great answer. Great answer. Great answer. Man, I was like, I'm like sitting there, like taking notes, like in my mind. I'm like, oh, Steve, I'm going to use well, this later. <laughs> well, you know, when he asked you that, you know, you know, my wife asked me the same question. She was like, well, what should they have done? And I was like, I don't have that answer. Like, yeah. you know, I don't know how the, you. The can correct answer, that. answer in that situation, like you said, the right answer is always avoidance and situational awareness. I mean, that's always the answer you want to go to. But in the situation where you get into a uh, into an altercation like that, there is. And this is the reason why I, I kind of loathe a lot of those women's self-defense seminars. There is no one magic technique that we right. can give so someone true. that will win every single fight. All those seminars are going to give you is false confidence. Um, if, it, if it were the case that you could just teach people one move that would always win a fight, we wouldn't be spending decades of our lives <laughs> training this stupid pajama Truth. wrestling because it wouldn't be necessary. <laughs> the, real, the reality is if you want to get good – at, at fighting against people who are bigger than you. The answer is fight against people who are bigger than you for eight to 10 years, and then you'll be able to do it. There's no magic pill. There's no magic solution. There's no groin shot or eye gouge that's going to get you there. It's about pressure testing your own body and your own composure and having enough versatility in your game that you can execute your game even against a giant. And that's going to take you a decade of your life. There's no magic answer to this solution. And I don't want to mislead anyone by telling them like, yeah, if you're a one-stripe white belt, you're going to be just as good as a ninja. No, it's like you're going to need to, to fight someone bigger than you and to overcome size and power. You need a hell of a lot of leverage. And to get a hell of a lot of leverage, you need a hell of a lot of mat time. And that's the only answer. One one fascinating top of that uh, I've been asking a lot of people lately is about loyalty in jujitsu because I think it's such an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Like I think I just said that twice in a row. Yeah. But, <laughs> but how do you feel about loyalty in jujitsu, especially as a black belt? You spend a lot of time investing your knowledge into people. How yeah. how do you view view them staying in your school or going training somewhere else or switching schools? It's a business, right? I mean, if people want to cancel their memberships, if people want to cancel their subscription to our services and the podcast. It's a business. Um, I, I don't begrudge anyone for taking their business elsewhere. If anything, I mean, I, I should assess whether it's because I could be better or if it's because of some extenuating circumstance, but either way, it's not worth getting upset about, right? I mean, if you're a barista and you want to run a Starbucks and a bunch of people that go there switch and then they start going to Seattle's best, I mean, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to go on Facebook and belittle them and call them creanches and shit? Or I mean, no, what you're going to do is you're going to say, thanks for your business. Hope you have a good time over at that other place. Um, loyalty is very, in, in terms of how we look at martial arts, I think most of our generation and our culture, we probably got into martial arts because we saw it in the movies, right? And we think that it's about being a lone badass who has this magical instructor and it's all about loyalty and respect and all of that stuff. Um, and of course, loyalty and respect are great things, but I think that a lot of jujitsu instructors demand loyalty that they haven't earned. Um, loyalty should be earned. If you're going to be loyal to someone, that should be because there's a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, if something toxic and nasty is going on in a gym, I have no moral obligation to keep paying my instructor my membership fees, right? Like I, I would not blink twice if something happened in my gym. And I learned this lesson quite painfully because I used to train at a gym where they specifically demanded loyalty. They even said that loyalty was the basis for promotions or one of the wow. bases for promotions. And sure enough, that gym went down the tube for a variety of cultural reasons and I don't train there anymore. And I acknowledge that there, there, is, there is something kind of woo-woo about martial arts, right? Even jujitsu, which is supposed to be this empirical, scientific martial art, yeah, it's, it's still a little bit woo-woo, right? I mean, I, there's no question that I have a very unique relationship with my training partners versus 
other people I might meet at Starbucks, right? It's not the same. Once you've gone in there and you've tried to cut off the blood flow to someone's brain and then you let them do that to you, you now have a special relationship, right? That's just the way it is. (laughs) No getting around that. But we also have to bear in mind that this is a business. It's a two-way street. Unless you're running a pyramid scheme, loyalty and money should not flow uphill like that, right? It has to be a two-way relationship. And you've only got my loyalty for as long as you've learned or you've earned it. If my instructor engages in some conduct that I don't agree with, or even if I just no longer agree with their pricing structure, I do not feel like it is reasonable to obligate people to pay those bills, right? It's a it's a business for crying out loud, right? At the end of the day, no matter how much lion and samurai and sheep and wolverine stuff we paint around this silly art, it's a business. A coach is selling a service and either they've earned that money or they haven't earned that money. And you should never feel bad about parting ways. Um, and any instructor who tries to demand loyalty of you or punish you for leaving a gym is a bad instructor. That's just the way it is. So while we're on this uh, topic, what do you think someone should look for when they're looking for a gym? Like some things they might not realize are important when they're looking for a gym that they might regret later. I I hate to say this, but my advice, honestly, is the first thing you should do is figure out who the instructors are at the gym and then Google their name in conjunction with a lot of words like rape, assault, crime, conviction. That escalated quickly. I'm I'm not not joking. I'm not joking (laughs) at all, right? Because the reality is the jujitsu community is very good at suppressing these kinds of stories. Um, And a lot of the time they never make it beyond a a blow up on social media or a message board. And if you're going to put your life in the hands of these people or put your, your kids or your spouse's life in the hands of these people, you want to make sure that these are good people. So the first thing I do is I do that. I Google the instructor, I add in some inflammatory keywords and I make sure that nothing comes up out of the gate. That's the first thing you should do. Um, The other thing to consider of course is commitment. I mean, I'm not a fan of long-term contracts, although I understand why they exist, but I always tell people, if you're starting at a new gym, the last thing you want to do is sign a long, long-term long contract because you don't know what you're getting into and jujitsu is expensive and you don't want to get stuck with like a $2,000 bill that you can't get out of. So my advice to people is whenever you go to a new gym, try it and go month to month until you get to the point where you feel like, okay, this is the place for me. And then after that, if you want to do long-term commitments, because it's better because the instructor gets stability and you get a bit of a cost break, go for it. Sure. But don't feel pressured to do that out of the gate. Um, I would also say that the whether or not your instructor is a 30-time world champion or not is totally irrelevant to their instructing ability. I mean, there's a good chance if you go to like a a massively competitive gym with an established instructor, there's a good chance they're going to have really good instruction. But there's more to jujitsu than just your instructor's competition resume. So look for more than that uh, is the other thing that I would say. And and of course, the other thing too to bear in mind is these people that are at the gym, you have to like them because you're going to be spending a lot of time training with these people. Likely, they're going to become your friends so if you don't like the people at your jiu-jitsu gym probably even if the instruction is really really good i would consider maybe just switching it up because at the end of the day jiu-jitsu is supposed to be fun and if you're not enjoying it why are you doing it man these are some great answers steve i'm not gonna lie to you like this is probably it's why like he's you... been doing this a while it's like it's like you have your own podcast it's like so <laughs> well, these are very common questions right one of the the biggest questions that people often get is what are some red flags to a new gym and so i'm quite well versed in answering these questions because they are very, very common. Um, It's also important to understand that affiliation doesn't mean that much to the quality of a gym. From my experience, a lot of, a lot of gyms will sell their gym by saying we are part of this massive franchise. And so therefore we're the best that that's not guaranteed. Um, In fact, being part of a franchise can be detrimental in a lot of situations. So um, I, now that said, I don't know how much that even means to a lay person anyway, because I certainly didn't know what like a Gracie Baja was until I started jujitsu. Uh, I think we overestimate how much these labels mean to people outside of the sports. But yeah, it's there's a lot of red flags that you want to look for when you start at a gym. But I would say you don't want them to lock you in uh, for an, a long term agreement unless you're really, really sure that it's good for everyone. Um, you don't want to uh, you, you do, rather you do want to do diligence on the instructor specifically specifically to see if they have any criminal history, because that is extraordinarily common. Um, I would also say check out the personal social media of the instructors and the people who go to that gym, because gyms have different culture vibes. And they, I mean, people at that gym might be doing things that you simply 
do not agree with from an ethical standpoint. And you want to know that out of the gate. I think that's important as well to understand. Um, but yeah, th these are kind of some of the main things that I would look for if you're trying to look for a new gym. No, that's great because I definitely feel, especially in a day where McDojos are still a thing. Yep. Unfortunately, even with social media, it's <laughs> good for someone, especially if they just start and they're like, well, hold on a second. Like maybe I didn't do that for my instructor. Maybe I should Google something on my instructor because I think it's a very important. Like you said, it's very important because a lot of things do get suppressed and mm -hmm. it doesn't come out for years or whatever so if you go to your school and you're brand new you're like uh you know what there was a little something funny about the way he talked yeah. to certain people it's like let me go ahead and and look deep deep a little bit deeper into it you know so but you we, we mentioned earlier that you have your bjj mental models podcast which i have been like binging lately every time i, go, I have like a 30 minute yeah <laughs> i have like a 30 minute drive to work so i can listen to almost an entire episode most days um what made you guys or what made you want to start uh, BJJ Mental Models? And did you ever think that you were going to be at the point where you are now? It was never the plan. Um, I started this just because I thought it would be a fun activity to do with my brother. We could talk about a, a shared interest. We could brainstorm, put some ideas together, and maybe even cook up a bunch of lessons that other people would benefit from. And it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And then at some point it um, around when the pandemic started, we opened up a Patreon. Uh, we don't really support the Patreon anymore. We've moved more towards a, a traditional subscription model for our premium stuff. But I was pretty shocked to realize that there are people who are willing to invest in us. And that has given me the leeway to invest further back into the product and build more things and do more things. But yeah, it was never the intent for this thing to to kind of grow up and blow up and be this big thing and to be a basically a business at this point. I, I thought it was just going to be like a fun side project, but yeah, here we are. It just kind of grew organically into what it is. What's your biggest lesson learned from, from having such a successful podcast? Um, to pick out a single lesson is hard to do. I would say that one thing I wasn't prepared for was public response. Um, it is hard if you're kind of more of an introverted person and you traditionally have stayed off social media as I have, it's hard to put yourself in a position where you're going to get a lot of criticism and, you know, opinions from people that you might not particularly handle very well. So a big thing that I didn't expect is like, look, there's a lot of really toxic people out there who will say really Shit. toxic things on the internet. And it's one thing to see it directed at like Lindsay Lohan. It's another thing when it's directed <laughs> at you. Um, and that has been a very strange experience, especially when people start sending like violent threats. It's like, what the fuck? I'm an internet podcaster, but you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it, it happens. Uh, and that's something that people need to be ready for. But on the other hand, and the other lesson I've learned on the flip side of that is if you want to be successful at anything, you have to put yourself in a place where you're going to get haters, right? The only yes. way to not have haters is to not do anything and to just hide in a corner. If you do anything, if you take a stand on anything, if you create anything, you will get criticism. Um, and it's just a matter of differentiating between who the helpful critics are who are criticizing you because they want things to be better versus who the toxic criticizers are who are doing something because they want to hurt you. Uh, and that's the thing that you have to learn to make a distinction between. Yeah. I told Travis when um, I noticed that I was like, what, what's ironic to me or a lot of the people that make those comments are the same people that you're going to meet in the gym. Yeah. Like, they're jujitsu practitioners. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I just hope you don't have them in your gym. You know, yeah. it's like the, the best thing I could say about it. Like, it is weird. We, I, I got a letter from someone. Well, not a letter, a, a digital message from someone the other day who wanted to fight me and they lived on the other end of the world, which I thought was bizarre. And as far as I can tell, it wasn't like I want to like hurt you. It was like, I'm challenging you to a duel, like that kind of thing. Like they were really serious about this. And I explained to them, I, first of all, no, if you showed up at my gym, I would say no, but you're on the other side of the world. And they said, okay, send someone else to fight me. And I'm like, you want me to send a champion? Like I'm like King Arthur or something? What the, what the hell? Who does this? Is this a game of thrones? Who's your proxy? <laughs> it, was, it was the weirdest thing. I've ever, weirdest interaction I've ever had with someone. It's like they wanted me to send a champion to fight on their behalf. So, Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Anyway. That's so funny. We have we have a, pod, or a podcast clip going on YouTube right now that's, that's kind of taken off, uh, especially the last couple of weeks. It's like blowing up. I'm really surprised on the amount of volume views we're getting right now. But there's a lot of, like you mentioned, there's a lot of people that, one, take the message out of context, right? And they, they hold on to like one thing within, yep. you know, the podcast or like you say one thing and they're like, they'll turn it however they want to. And they're like, you're an idiot because you said this. It's like, 
you're taking it out of context, and the, the context is literally in front of you. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, or they'll be like, my, probably my favorite comment. Um, I, I even posted it in our, our little group chat, but our, our episode, our podcast is called Elbows Tight, right? Mm-hmm. But a guy commented on our YouTube video. He's like, Elbows Tight? Question mark. More like buttholes loose. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I was like, I liked it. I'm like, pin that comment. That's great. Like, I don't even what understand do you- it. I don't either, but I was like, oh, okay, that's the complete. Thank you for watching the. Ch- yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the interaction because you're boosting me in the algorithm. So I don't really <laughs> even care. <laughs> like you're actually benefiting me, so I appreciate that. But it's true, like especially when you put something out there, and that was a big concern for us too when we first started the podcast, is because we were white belts when we first started, and like who wants to listen to white belts talk about jujitsu? Like we know absolutely nothing about, and we're still we're blue belts, and we still know don't know anything yeah, right? about we, jujitsu. Yeah. You know, and but luckily we've we've been pretty fortunate to have pretty good feedback for the most part um, from the community on you know liking what we have to say and what other people have to say because I think it's a very uh, not focused on topic of what is it like when you when you first start and asking questions that people honestly are. They're like, man, is this a common thing? And then when you're in a black belt that's been doing it for 13 years, like, man, that shit happens to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, you you bring up the whole imposter syndrome thing, and it's not. I mean, it's not just you. I have my competition record is zero, zero, and zero. Undefeated, so, baby. Undefeated. I, I, what I like to say is that I think that's actually technically better than like Carlos Gracie Senior. So I'm just saying he invented the sport. I have a more winning record than him, so it can't be that bad. Um, but I I had the same thought. I thought like. The, look, the world is full of jujitsu world champions. You can't throw a stick on Instagram without hitting a jujitsu world champion. So why would anyone listen to a guy who doesn't even compete? Um, and I certainly doubted my ability to do this for a very long time. And then at around episode 90, we started bringing on guests and we would have all of these people who just like agreed with us and backed up what we were saying. And it really gave me a big confidence boost. And something I've learned, and, and I think a mistake that we make in jujitsu a lot of the time is that Everyone has a lesson to teach you. Everyone has something they can teach you. And we shouldn't worship the black belts and the world champions just because they're that. I think way too many people are dismissive and they say, I don't want to learn from that guy. He's just a brown belt. Or I don't, what what championships have, has this guy? I mean, I just, it's funny. I was just talking to uh, someone else about this, a very well-known black belt. Um, and I, I saw that this person got criticism and they basically said, why should anyone listen to you? You're a, you're not even a world champion. And I'm thinking, this guy is like one of the most legit black belts in the world. Everyone knows. <laughs> who this person is i think people want to listen to him and this is this is a thing that i i have learned which is that everyone has a lesson to teach you um and saying that you shouldn't talk about jujitsu because you're a blue belt or a white belt or you have nothing to contribute that's bullshit everyone has something to contribute because i don't care how little you know about this thing right that we do I don't care how smart I am. The reality is the two of us are smarter together. That's always going to be true. So even if you're like a one month white belt and I'm a 30 year black belt, there's still a good chance that if we talk long enough, you would have some insight or some weird observation that would never have occurred to me. And shutting down dialogue and telling people to shut up and get off the internet is not conducive to that practice. Yeah, That's- You remember when me and Travis used to meet people at work? We didn't know they were into jujitsu, and we talk about it, and they're like, and the first question they would ask us is, what belt are you? What belt are you? Yeah. And we'd be like, oh, we're white belts. So like, all right, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so you're not, <laughs> we you're, like, you don't what? really do jujitsu is what that means. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the one belt everyone gets in jujitsu is the white belt. Yeah, Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, <laughs> I, so. I have to admit, I have to admit, it as much as I advocate against the belt system, it was a bit of a relief to get my black belt because now I wouldn't get that response anymore. Because I, I remember going to people and be like, oh, you jujitsu, you must be really good at this stuff. What belt are you? And I'd be like, I'm a brown belt. And they'd be like, oh, you know, visibly disappointed. <laughs> yeah. It's basically and a you're black like, are you belt, kidding bro? me? Like- that was eight years of my life I invested into this. Thanks a lot, buddy. But once you get your black belt, everyone's just like, ooh, magic man has a black belt. Yeah. Can't question anything he says. Yeah, yeah we put hilarious. we put black belts on such a high pedestal. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's like that guy, especially when you when you first start. I remember the first time someone walked in our gym and they put the a black unicorn. belt on, and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I was like, that's a freaking black belt, man. Like yeah. that's crazy. Because at the time, our highest belt in the gym was a purple belt, yeah. right? And yeah. I was like, and actually, I think the highest belt that ever came in before a black belt was a brown belt. Our old our old professor, and he put a brown belt on, and I was like. 
there is so much I can learn from this man. Like I am gonna just, I'm just gonna listen to everyone and no, n- no BS. Yeah. The first thing he ever said in class was just how to how to adjust your grip. Our our instructor was talking about like, okay, so you're gonna grab a sleeve here and do this, and he's standing in the class and he's like, can I just chime in real quick? And everyone's like, Scroll. yes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> let the brown belt talk. And he's like, so just a simple thing, like when you grab a grip, you just think of it like a monkey wrench. And you just want to tighten it up. You know what I mean? Just tighten it up, and it's gonna be a much stronger grip. Until this day, that less that single yep. thing has yeah. stuck with me yeah. throughout my jujitsu. It's completely changed my game, right? When I grab someone, I'm like, all right, monkey monkey grip. You yep. know what I mean? And it's it's just so funny how we put belts on such a high pedestal when a brown belt and a black belt honestly could be like pretty much in my eyes they could be pretty much the my same my thing. instructor always said that like look the only difference between a brown belt and a black belt is that a brown belt is just a young black belt like it's they're basically the same thing and yes. po- by the time you get to brown belt it's really just about like the finishing touches just refining things a little bit and a lot of it honestly is i I don't know if everyone agrees with this, but I believe that a lot of black belt is about your mindset, your relationship with the sport, your contributions back to the sport. And at some point you train long enough and you start to kind of develop that mindset of like the elder statesman and your focus is all about giving back to people and helping and being a good role model and that's kind of the point where probably you're a black belt in my mind that's like the main difference because at a brown belt level you can you're probably good enough to whoop a lot of black belts if you're a brown belt but the reality is you're still you don't have much time in the oven yet at at the at that top experience level and you probably still just need a little bit of time to just you know the finishing touches so to speak yeah i've rolled with some brown belts that were uh way rougher than some black belts oh yeah like a lot of black belts are just like hobbyists who have been doing it for a long time like my accountant is a black belt he's not going to win worlds or anything he's just been doing jujitsu as long as i have so whenever he and i roll it's just two like old out of shape guys just (laughs) flopping all over the place but in a very technical fashion um but a lot of black belts are just very very experienced white belts right and that's that's really all it is. It is funny that we worship the black belt so much because it is a totally unregulated certification, right? (laughs) Just because I have a black belt doesn't mean some other person's going to agree that I should be a black belt and vice versa. Um, And it's, it's like, it's like being a certified life coach. Like what the fuck does that even mean? (laughs) You know, it's no one, there's no, you didn't have to write a thesis and get, uh, go to an accredited university and defend your thesis to get a black belt. I just literally showed at the gym, long enough until eventually they ran out of belts to give me like that's it, it's cool that i've got this thing but it, it really doesn't mean that much at the end of the day and we the main thing the black belt is good for is making like white and blue belts feel better about losing right so that they've like ah oh, it's of course i lost um but other than that it's it can be very damaging because like you said it, it is a symbol of authority and it is easily abused as a symbol of authority sometimes What's a good piece of advice you'd have for a brand new white belt? It has to be fun. Um, more than anything else, it yeah, it's great to have a great coach. It's great to train with elite level competitors. It's great to train 12 times a day. It's great to be a modern day ninja warrior, whatever. But if it's not fun, you're not going to stick around for a long time. And a lot of people seem to... Um, they, they lose the fun in jujitsu. It becomes a chore. They, they put too much of a burden on themselves. They, they wind up hating the sport and they burn out. It has to be fun. I, I would rather be a mediocre grappler who enjoys every day than be a world champion who hates every moment. Right. So I'd say it has mm, to be fun. That's great. That's so true too, because like we mentioned earlier, people have that unhealthy relationship with jujitsu when they first start off, it becomes that uh like they just like they start being hard on themselves Mm -hmm. and then it's no longer fun you go through your blue belt blues and then you end up quitting you know what i mean it's like like just go back to like there's almost a parallel to to a romantic relationship right when you start off at white belt there's this infatuation phase and then around blue belt the honeymoon is over and now you got to really think about okay am i sticking around for the long term and then you stick around and around the time you get to brown belt you get like that seven year itch and you start to have an existential crisis about is this really how i want to spend my life and then by the time you get to black belt it's like fuck it yeah that is how i want to spend my life (laughs) Um, but it, I, I do see the same kind of patterns. And I, I think that, yeah, there is an infatuation pay, phase that a lot of people go through. And it's always fun to watch the the helium eventually just dribble out of that balloon over the first year or two is eventually they realize that initial enthusiasm wears off. And then what's left after that, right? If you don't have a healthy relationship with jujitsu still, you're going to be one of those people who quits. So it has to be fun. It always has to be fun. 
jujitsu is 100% a marathon. It is not yeah. a sprint. And I feel like a lot of people think it's a sprint to get to that first belt. And then once you get to blue belt, your blue to purple is typically your longest belt, right? Yeah. Like, so they, they sit there and they're at their blue belt for six months. They're like, hold on a second. I'm not a purple belt yet. It's like, yeah, no shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. relax. Like, it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit. Oh, that that is, I think, another thing, right? And I think it's by design. I, I I mean, I don't know. I can't ask whoever invented the belt system, but I think it was by. It feels like it was by design to make it take so long to get to purple belt, because I remember that feeling of when I started jujitsu. I was like counting the days to get every single stripe, and then counting the days to get the blue belt because I couldn't wait to get this white piece of crap off my waist so that people <laughs> would actually think I knew something. And then I got the blue belt. And now suddenly it's like I saw the the vastness of the void, right? You know, when you're a white belt, all you see are the other white belts and the other blue belts, and you're all within about one year of experience of each other. But then you get to blue belt, and now all of a sudden all of the purple belts and the brown belts and the black belts are paying attention to you, and the skill gap there can be like, these people might have been doing this for a decade longer than you, and you have no chance against them. Um, and that really was an eye-opening thing, especially because you don't have that quick dopamine hit anymore of getting a lot of stripes and getting promotions, because you're probably going to be wearing that blue belt for a long time. And if you don't really love jujitsu, uh, it, it's unlikely you're going to hang around, especially because a lot of your friends probably got to blue belt and then quit. And so now that social infrastructure has has dwindled a bit. So what's really holding here you here anymore? And for that reason, it, blue belt can be legitimately depressing. So I, I sympathize with the people who get the blue belt blues because I was certainly one of them back in the day. Well, Steve, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was a, a great, I mean, I got so many snippets out of this. I'm like thinking in my head, like, I'm just going to go back and listen to this again. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for your time today. John, you got anything else? No, those are some great answers, man. I appreciate it. Those, yeah, absolutely. Those were, those well, were no great. worries. I mean, I can't thank you enough for having me. I always love coming on and having conversations like this, especially because elbows tight is such an important concept in and of itself. I'm happy to promote, if promoting this episode will help people bring their elbows in and retract them so they don't get arm barred <laughs> then we've done good work here yeah, absolutely <laughs> people try to avoid saying elbows tight around yeah, us because we're like oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. This, that's right <laughs> <laughs> so steve if uh, people want to follow you and uh listen to your podcast and stuff wh where can they follow you and, and see your podcast at just go to bjjmentalmodels.com or alternately just google bjj mental models you should find it pretty pretty easily um up there we've got a data uh, we've got our website which links off to everything we do but the place that most people probably are going to start with is the the podcast so if you go to bjjmentalmodels.com you'll see it all what's what's behind your premium wall so if people are interested sure so the main thing with doing a podcast once you get up to a certain scale is your ability to help people on a more direct and intimate basis gets restricted because there's too many people so the way that I think of things is the public stuff that we do is kind of the stuff that we put out there for free to help people to give them ideas and honestly to help keep people engaged when times are hard because this is one of the things i love about the audio plat the platform is that look we go through rough times i mean i got a lot of friends right now who are really sick as a dog because they got covid and the thing i love about podcasts is if you can't train jujitsu and you're tired of watching 10 hours of john danaher drone on about whatever podcasts are there for you right it, it, i love the podcasting as a medium and so that's for me, the goal is always to promote the podcast. Now, that said, if you want more than that, part of what we're trying to build is a library of like strategy courses and concept courses, not just by myself, but in conjunction with more reputable and more more intelligent people than myself. So like we've got courses with um, like Rob Bernacki, Margot Ciccarelli and John Thomas are coming up. So we, we are building like a, a master class of jujitsu, if you will. Uh, and that's the premium stuff. We also offer direct coaching, which I have to put behind a paywall just because I can't give that much of my time away for free. It's such an intense of thing to coach people one-on-one -on -one. so that's the offer um, if anyone wants to check that premium stuff out though there's a free trial so i do always encourage people to try it if nothing else you're going to get a lot of great free content and then you can cancel before you even pay a cent so if you go to bjjmentalmodels.com you'll see a big premium button just mash on that and uh that's where i normally send people if they are looking for more of what we offer well steve thank you so much once again john you got anything else nope Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you for listening and watching at home. And uh, remember, no oil checks here. <laughs> <Yes>. Thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks. Take care. Bye.